Right. Uh, okay, good morning and thank you very much for coming on a Saturday. I mean, uh, I'm glad to see so many people here. Uh, and hopefully the idea is to uh, make your day as useful as possible. So as uh, uh, Jonathan mentioned, uh, I've been doing uh, at the upper limb, upper limb list regularly for the last five to six years now. And uh, luckily I have been moving with the changes that's happening. So I'd like to take you back of what was before, where we are now. Uh, and we'll focus mostly on the shoulder surgery. That's where the, the conundrum is. Uh, looking at its E-day, so I think we'll, we'll, we'll stick to the main bit, which is the shoulder surgery. Right, okay, so my talk will cover basically the anatomy of the brachial plexus supplying the shoulder, uh, phrenic nerve, why it's important, and uh, touch on the phrenic nerve sparing blocks. Now, I've been doing awake shoulder surgery for the last five years now, so if you're interested, I can go in details of that and we can talk about it. And we'll touch on the uh, perineal catheters uh, done for uh, shoulder surgery and, and day surgery as well, which I think in RVI, Jonathan is already doing it here anyway. Right, so going back to the basics. So before that, I'll just take you to this slide first. Uh, and I would like to just to understand the nerve supply. So, you know, we all are familiar with that. But the important bit is for the shoulder, what are the main uh, nerves in, involved? So, suprascapular nerve is the most important nerve, which supplies 60 to 70 percent of the nerve supply to the, to the shoulder followed by the axillary nerve. So these are the two uh, big arrows. And obviously, uh, the other nerves, uh, which are equally important, lateral patrol nerve, and then the superior sub, uh, subscapular and the inferior subscapular nerves, and a part of musculocutaneous nerve. Now, if you track it back, you can see they're all coming off the upper trunk, C5, C6. Yeah, so it's important that if you're doing anything for the shoulder, the upper trunk has to be uh, blocked. <laughs> whether it's awake or whether it is uh, for analgesic block. Now, if I take you back to this slide, in terms of, uh, so we talked about these five nerves. Now, supraclavicular nerves, I don't know if, if many of you have heard about that. This is a, uh, no, we supply the, the skin bit over the shoulder, and that's particularly important if you're doing the awake shoulders. And it's not difficult to block. I'll touch on it when I'm talking about the, the awake shoulder. But this is important uh, nerve which you need to block if you're doing awake shoulders. And looking at, at the specific things, what is, is sort of blocking, uh, sort of supplying what? You can look at, uh, you know, for specific uh, areas of the shoulder which, which are supplied by these nerves. So there was a, a paper recently in, in RAPIM which uh, looked at uh, Okay, so in Kadawa, where they looked at individual nerves supplying uh, uh, the shoulder and uh, tracking the, the nerves, suprascapular and the axillary and other branches, if you want to look at details. Right, so this is uh, the holy grail of, of shoulder surgery, which I think everybody's familiar with. And I just, uh, can anybody identify what it is here? Of what you could could it be just guesses. There's no no you know prizes for that. Sorry. So that's the phrenic nerve here. That one. So this oh, this is the brachial plexus which we normally block in upper trunk, and this is what I was interested. So just uh, the image again. So lateral side, medial side, medial scalenus, anterior scalenus, sternal mastoid, uh, your jugular, and the artery. Uh, this is where you block your upper trunk. And this is where the phrenic nerve lives. So why is the phrenic nerve important? Because you can imagine if you put your local there, you're pretty much going to block phrenic nerve. And the two ways the phrenic nerve is involved, one is obviously the, the local tracking over the anterior scalenus and blocking the phrenic nerve. And other is you can block higher up. If you look at the nerve supply for, for diaphragm is uh, three, four, five, keeps the diaphragm alive. So you can easily get the uh, a cranial spread, especially with higher volumes, and get the phrenic nerve. Now, interestingly, uh, there are many studies done to minimize uh, the, the, the risk of phrenic nerve by reducing the volumes, and they've gone down to up to five mils, and even then, you, there's not, you still get that you'll get phrenic nerve without and with actually compromising the, the interscaling block. So, 
essentially what it means is if you're doing interscaling block, you're getting the phonic nerve. Uh, this is just my the shoulder setup. It's not the awake one. Uh, an important thing for the shoulder surgery, which uh, most people will know, uh, is there it, like there are head up position, and what it means is you you the blood supply or blood pressure in the brain is less than what is being measured here, and that's the key. There have been few case reports with patients, uh, you know, waking up with some sort of neurological case de uh, deficits including blindness, strokes, and things. It's not that common, but the potential is always there. And it's not just the, the height, the way they're sitting up. Now, this is a shoulder replacement. If you're talking about uh, uh, arthroscopic surgery, they're pretty much bolt upright, and I'll show you on one of the other slides. They're pretty much bolt upright, and that distance is much higher. So the important thing to remember is with the blood pressure, what you're measuring here, and what you're getting here is, is much less. And it has been proven with near uh, NIRS sort of uh, uh, spectrometry that the saturations in the brain are sort of significantly lower depending on how long the surgery is and what are the significance of that. And there was a study in 2010 which said that if in sitting position, in spite of maintaining normal blood pressure, uh, there, is a, there is a decreased saturation in the brain and there's a risk of sickness. And in addition to you know, cognitive impairment, things can happen depending on the, the, the inherent sort of uh, pathology of the patient, you know, change that to an uh, old patient with, with a pre-existing dementia and thing, and there's a very high risk of, of stroke. So something to be aware. So I routinely, if I'm blocking and under anesthetic, I use a phenylephrine infusion to keep the blood pressure as normal, if not higher than what they have, to minimize the risk of uh, any sort of uh, ischemia to the brain. And in, in addition, the CO2 is probably kept at higher normal so that we can maintain the blood supply to the brain without compromising uh, uh, any sort of uh, deficits to the brain. Right, so going back to the phrenic nerve, so this was the first paper uh, by Omi. Uh, actually, they've done a lot of work that time in 1992, you can imagine, and where they looked at uh, uh, volunteers uh, with interscaline block um, and looking at the diaphragmatic function with ultrasound at that time, so which is um, very impressive. 1992, they were actually looking at that. And what they came up was up to 25% loss in FRC in healthy volunteers. If you have an ipsilateral block uh, of interscaling, which implies uh, ferric nerve involvement on that side. Now, you can argue that we're talking about 45 mils here. Now, studies with 20 mils has, have proven that you still get the hematophromatic paralysis on that side, so which, which we normally use these days. So what it means is you will get ferric nerve palsy and you will get a 25% reduction in your, in your uh, FRC. And this is we're talking about in healthy volunteers. Now put it that to patients who are obese, who have uh, uh, previously lung conditions, but certainly in Gates, I get lots of patients with COPD and, and you know, uh, and imagine, and, and in fact, in, their, in this study, they had two patients who had, uh, one had uh, asthma and had COPD, not bad, and the, the reduction in FRC was much higher than that. And if you add obese, obese patients, lie them flat, and then we are in big trouble. Has anybody had any incidences of uh, ferritin palsy needing support, respiratory support? How many just out of interest? Okay. In last year or so, we have had three patients who needed in, uh, uh, ventilated support post ferritin nerve, uh, well, post uh, uh, endoscopic block. That's the CPT picture, Yeah, okay. So, th so this, this is interscalene. Uh, so what it means is it just sort of uh, makes you think, yes, for the, the interscalene block is great. It works, you know, perfect for the, for the shoulder surgery. But you have to be mindful of the patients who have pre existing lung conditions, who are obese, that they can bec become, you know, you can run into difficulties if, if, they, if they end up uh, losing the, the respiratory function on that side. And just to uh, put again a slide just to s on the same paper, to see how what happens to, to the, the, the so this is this is volume on the side this is the flow and how it is decreasing uh, with passing time and also they looked at five minutes and I think the peak comes around 10 to 15 minutes when you get the peak effect of uh, depending on what local you're using as well. Right. Okay. Uh, so obviously, what what it meant was people were looking to to find ways to have adequate analgesia here for shoulder surgery. Uh, without involving the phrenic nerve. So this paper came in anesthesia intensive care by Price, Price is, uh, in New Zealand, 
Now, he had been working on this for some time, and actually, uh, commendable for him, uh, the suprascapular nerve was, you know, we were aware of, of that, you know, the pain people block it over the, uh, in the spine of the scapula, but the other dextrin nerve was not available at that time. So he actually himself looked at the anatomy, you know, MRIs, cadavers, and developed his own technique of blocking the dextrin nerve as well. So obviously what this says, and he came up with the shoulder block technique, which meant that a selective blockade of, uh, of uh, the suprascapula and dextrin nerve will give you a, a decent pain relief in patients where you cannot do interscaling block for the reasons I mentioned above. So, uh, so I'll just quickly go through that. Uh, sorry, I think this is come. We'll talk about it later. Okay, I think I've missed this. Okay, so this was his technique of of doing the X-ray nerve block. Now this is the X-ray nerve. We're not talking about X-ray plexus. The X-ray nerve block. I won't go in details of that. Uh, just to to show how he did it with ultrasound, we can actually see better. And this is one of the images I've taken, just a snapshot of a video uh, where they're demonstrating the, the exit nerve. So essentially, uh, what the exit nerve basically lives over the humerus. So as you're going up cranially, now this side is the cranial end. So this is, this is cranial, this is uh, caudal. So as the probe goes up, you can see the, the humerus coming up there, teres minor, tricep this side and deltoid muscle on top of it, and the next nerve lives there, just next, sorry, nerve here, next to the uh, circumflex artery. Now this is the image which is mentioned where exactly is, is the nerve there. Okay, now we can touch on it in the demonstration when we talk about it. Uh, this is another, so his approach was like short axis approach, so he blocked in this way. Uh, plainly the reason he did that because uh, he found that it's, it's consistent to have the posterior humeral border like that. And it's deltoid here, humeral border here, uh, that's, the, that's the local. So what he said is you can put the local over the humerus under the deltoid, you'll get the nerve. So it was not a difficult uh, uh, block to do on the ultrasound. And this was uh, the, uh, the same image with under ultrasound. Right, coming back to the suprascapular nerve. Now, people who have, who do pain regularly and you know, who have interest in pain, uh, they, they would be familiar with, with the uh, landmark approach for uh, uh, suprascapular nerve, which is very commonly used for patients with uh, shoulder pain, and it works pretty effectively, and it's pretty uh, easy to do uh, with landmark. Just put it over the spine of the scapula, and, uh, and you should put the local over the, uh, it should get the suprascapular nerve. Now in this day and age of ultrasound, I'm not very convinced uh, with the landmark technique. I would like to see things. So uh, on ultrasound, as you can see, the, the only difference is it's fairly deep. I'll show you on the slides how deep it is. So you can see where it is, you can't do it, but it's a bit less convincing if, if you want to see the, the nerve. You can't see it very well. You have to use a proxy that you can see the, uh, the, the scapular notch the uh, trapezius supraspinatus and you go through and put local there next to the artery. It works well, uh, but it's again, if, you don't, if you're not convinced without seeing it, you probably wouldn't want to do that. Right, uh, I think it's a little bit messed up there. Yeah. Right, going back to the, the options available now. Uh, so one was this one, and coming back, now this study came in in BJ, in 2016, uh, very interestingly what they said is if you put your local next to the plexus, so not very close to the plexus, you're putting extra facial. So what they, and, and they did the, at the, they looked at the uh, diaphragmatic excursion with ultrasound and they found that the diaphragm was not involved uh, up to half an hour. But the limitation of the study which themselves uh, agree on that is they didn't look at the diaphragmatic function after the operation, which I suspect, you know, if you put the local in there, obviously it does take time for it to reach there. So in first half an hour, they could not get any involvement of the diaphragm, great. But what it doesn't mean is that the local hasn't gone up and brought the diaphragm. And they didn't look at the patients uh, who had uh, any sort of pre lung conditions. And even in this case, they came up with 20% incidence of frank nerve palsy. So it's one in five. 
So obviously, if, if, you, if I'm a consultant anesthetist, I would be wary of putting a local there if I'm worried about the lung functions, because one in five chances that patient will get the diaphragmatic uh, palsy. Uh, so, I mean, it was a good study, but it has its own limitations, and it's not 100% again. Right, uh, so this was a review uh, in 2017, Rapam again, which looked at uh, the availability of studies for uh, uh, diaphragm sparing blocks. And obviously, the top one in that was uh, this, this study where they're doing the shoulder block, X-ray nerve and suprascapular. Uh, so, I mean, the, the only issue with that is the analgesia was, is also obviously suboptimal compared to interscaline, and uh, which, which the author suggested it might be good enough for a minor shoulder surgery, but it's not, uh, you know, not as good as interscaling blocks. So it was a good attempt. So obviously the risk of phenic nerve will be minimal here because you're staying away from the central plexus at all. You're going periphery to suprascapular nerve over the scapula and exit nerve in the humerus. So obviously the risk of uh, phenic nerve palsy is minimal here, but the pain relief is still not good enough compared to interscaling, which is the gold standard for pain relief. And there was a talk about a C7 nerve, nerve root, which again, the risk was 13% phenic nerve, but what they haven't uh, documented at a C7 level, there's a higher risk of uh, 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 you, you local going near the vertebral artery or into the artery, so they haven't documented that and there's not many studies about it as well. So it is not, you know, foolproof. And then the study about uh, supraclavicular, which again, uh, you wouldn't use suprasapula, is probably not always good enough for an uh, interscarine block, and it's again not uh, very clear whether you will get pharyngnome or not, because with 20 mils of supraclavicular, it's a risk that you might get uh, the pharyngnome anyway. So basically what we're left with, till that was this, this was the best option. Right, now, so in 2012, Interestingly, this study was described by this group in Austria, and, and this, this guy is a very you know, clever chap. He's an anatomist and a son sonologist, uh, and they have got access to cadavers and uh, a CT scans, so they can easily do studies. So, uh, so basically what they said, rather than going suprascapular block over the scapula, you can actually block it anterior or in the, in the clavicular region under the omoid muscle. So if I say that's lateral, that's medial, so we're doing supraclavicular block, move your uh, probe laterally, so that's your supraclavicular, uh, you know, uh, bracket plexus. And as you're going laterally, you can see this hyperechoic omohoid muscle coming up here, and there's omohoid, uh, sorry, the suprasapular nerve in this uh, place. So you can, so this is what they demonstrated that you can see the suprasapular nerve here, so 2012. Now, interestingly, similar, same group, I mean, certainly Morigal was there, they came up with the study so this is just to compare, this is what the image of uh, uh, suprascapular in the, in the, over the scapular uh, uh, region. A schematic diagram just to show where this is lateral, medial. Uh, this is the trapezius muscle, sternocleidal mastoid, brachial plexus behind it, and the omoid, and the, and the dotted line is the omoid nerve, which runs, takes a course behind the omoid and goes uh, uh, under the trapezius. So this study came in, and this is, uh, uh, I think, the latest study which has created a lot of uh, uh, buzz in, in the world of, uh, you know, upper limb and shoulder, and there have been a lot of responses to this, uh, a good four or five replies. Every rap from the last couple of editions, somebody is replying to this, and for, this, for the reasons it, it is. So what they, they, they said is, so they compared the anterior suprascapular nerve block, which we just mentioned about, with the, inter with the interskin break plexus block for shoulder surgery, and what they came up was that, it is preferable to interscaling block. It provides excellent analgesia without exposing patients to impaired mobility and to risk of more potent but also more invasive interscaling block. So what it means is, what they showed that the pain relief was actually uh, not inferior, which is again a very interesting terminology they've used. It's not inferior to the interscaling block. Uh, at the same time, uh, they did a grip strength of the hand to say that the, the, the break effects not involved completely as well. So I'll just show you a couple of slides to, to to make it understand what I'm trying to say. So here we are, in terms of pain relief, so if we forget about this, we're looking at uh, time since operation. Now this is suprascapular nerve, and this is interscaline, right? So if you look from here, so 10 to 30 minutes since operation, the, the NRS, which is the, the numerical pain score, and this is the time, it is higher in suprascapular, so patients are more in more pain here at between 10 to 30 minutes. The moment it goes beyond 30 minutes, 
the pain relief in suprascapular nerve is better. So it's between 1.5, whereas interscreen is 2. And then they did at 6, 6 hour, which is interscreen is here and suprascapular is here. And next reading was at 24 hours, and they extrapolated this data straight to there, which is pretty much similar. So infer, basic inferring on that, what they said, the pain relief in suprascapular nerve block was better than interscreen block, uh, which, which is what implies looking at, 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 this, at this graph. Now, next study, sorry, next, next slide, uh, sorry before that. Right, I had, I had uh, the slide as well. So basically, another, another slide was about the, the hand grip strength, which they uh, looked in the suprascapular nerve, the, the grip strength was there. And the, what it implies was, they're trying to say that there was no proximal spread of the local to suggest that it has gone on to block the, the other brachial plexus. So because there was no uh, uh, drop in muscle strength in the hand, they could say that uh, the, the plexus blocks, the, the local did not track it track up compared to the scaling, which had much higher incidence of uh, a block on the hands. Uh, now before I go any further, I'll ask Christine, this was another image uh, from what they, so they do, in Australia mostly they do out of plane techniques, so they always do their loss out of plane. So this is the pro position, that's the moid, uh, this is the clavicle, and this is the suprascapular nerve. Uh, so the block, you can see it's fairly uh, lateral to that. So before I go further, uh, Christina was a medical student, Christina, she, she's been doing a st dye study here, and looking at uh, putting dye uh, under the omoid muscle, and looking how it spreads. So I'll let Christina put her laptop in this. Uh. Yeah. Uh, good morning, my name is Christina. I'm going to be taking an MRI student uh, here at Newcastle. And I did a sub and hired neck dissection. So just to give a bit of background, as part of my MRES, I chose to do a surgical anatomy module, um, where we chose to do uh, an eight-week dissection project of whatever region the body is down to. Um, so I chose the neck. So with Dr. Womack, I decided to do this um, sub hyoid looking at this plane block using dye. Um, and obviously, following on from what Ash has said, this is used for regional anesthesia for pain relief, um, because the dull sound is an interstadium block, which blocks the bone plexus, as previously been said, but this is looking at the plane instead. So this is clinical data that I was sent um, from Dr. Varma. Um, this shows that there was, he used 150 patients where five mils of local anesthetic was injected, um, to target the suprascapular nerve, and as expected, it blocked the suprascapular nerve. And in a handful of patients, about 15, um, 10 to 15 mils was used, and this was to not directly target the suprascapular nerve, but within that plane, and that also blocked the suprascapular nerve. So this was kind of the clinical context that I was given before going into this cadaveric dissection. So our aim was to kind of show visual evidence in a cadaver that we could see that the suprascapular nerve was being blocked and also to kind of cover the side effects of this chest heaviness that patients were experiencing, um, which was either hypothesised to be the phrenic nerve or the long thoracic nerve. So we went to go and have a look and see if it affected either. Um, so basically what we were doing, we were injecting it in cadaver and seeing where it went. Um, so this is a picture of Dr. Romat injecting cadaver with um, a combination of latex and dye and using an ultrasound machine to do that. So just to show kind of what we were looking at, so you can see that's the inferior belly, belly of Omaha highlighted in orange, and you've got, as Ash already pointed out, the suprascapular nerve and the brachial plexus just underneath. And this is my needle full of dye and latex going underneath, kind of the tendon in between the two bellies. And then this diagram here on the left is kind of just to show the direction of the needle, which I'll come on to explain why that's important. Um, but we did posterior to anterior lateral to medial. So, as Ash has previously said, while we're targeting, targeting the suprascapular nerve, um, it comes off the superior trunk, um, of C5 and C6. It's important because it has two terminal branches to the supraspinatus muscle and infraspinatus muscle, and has sensory innovation to both the glenohumeral joint and the chromoclavicular joint, so therefore obviously important in shoulder surgery. So now I'm just going to talk you through my incision, the layers I went through just to get through the dissection. So I started off by doing a big kind of radical neck dissection, um, just to explain what that big gash is in the middle, that wasn't me, that was um, one of the embalming team. They just pulled out the pocket after you and back to it. So I, I did it from both sides of the neck, but some of the images I've got both of them in, but I actually looked more onto the left side where that gash doesn't kind of get in the way. So the first structure I hit was platysma. You can see those fibers running out. Um, platysma is obviously quite interesting muscle just because it has no tenderness or ligamentous attachments and sits just over the chest wall, so that's what you hit first. 
and then I dissected away off the fascia underneath, and that's where you can see it. You can see the fibres a bit more clearly, just running up there. So the next thing we hit was stellar mastoid. Um, you can see I highlighted in like pink the two heads, the cavicular head and the sternum head. Um, and you can see those two structures running over it. You've got the greater orbicular nerve and the external jugular vein. Just to orientate you, you're looking at your left side and you've got the thyroid cartilage in the middle, so that's the, your midline. And you can see where the mandible is, just where the submandible ground is, just sitting underneath it. So now I'll just talk about omohyde. So, sector further underneath the sternum mastoid to get to omohyde. Um, you can see the superior belly and the inferior belly, and just highlight that in orange. Um, this muscle attaches inferiorly to the scapula and up to the hyoid bone with a tendon in the middle, and it's an infrahyoid muscle that depresses um, the hyoid bone. It's important because in this study because it sits within pretracheal fascia, which is where we're aiming for with our dye. And as you can see, you can start to see some of that grey dye underneath, which is not normally there. So I've now chopped off omohyde, so you can see a little trunk down the bottom there, and I've lifted it up once in my blue glove, and you've got stenocleidomastoid off and platysmal still up. And I just want to draw out where the internal jugular vein is. In this cadaver, they're really papery thin, so you can't actually see them, but that was my medial order of where the dye went, because that's in a different layer of fascia. So now, just to kind of directly show you where the dye actually went. So all of that grey stuff is the dye, and you can see that Blue dotted line is where the medial border is, which is where the internal jugular vein is. My superior border was basically the superior border of omohyde, which we kind of expect because that's where we injected. And then it runs down laterally, and you can see where that green arrow is, that's one of the nerves poking through, that's actually the suprascapular nerve. Um, so the dye went as far as that. And it also spread infraclavicularly as well, but not too far. We just took the clavicle off and it was just underneath. So what I also wanted to show you was this image, which was a previous um, MRS student that did the same project as me, but used a different type of dye, and the, the needle direction was also in a different way. So this dye was methylene blue, and it just kind of went everywhere and just spread throughout all the soft tissues, whereas latex is very rubbery, it just sits where it gets injected, it doesn't soak through tissues. And this injection was done the opposite way um, to my cadaver, so it was from anterior to posterior, medial to lateral. And as you can see, the dye is literally on the opposite side of omohyoid. So just to orientate you, you've got stenocline and mastoid reflected, and then you've got the two bellies of omohyoid, and it's literally sitting above, so you don't get any infraclavicular spread either. So now on this image, I've, I've completely dissected all the dye away, but you can see there's still a few bits that are just horrible in grey and blue. So I think we basically, we probably hit a vein as we went through, but you can't really tell that on ultrasound scan on a cadaver, because they've got no blood in them. Um, so we think the vein was hit, but I don't think that made any effect to where the dye spread. So you can see the transverse cervical vein and the suprascapular vein running across. <coughs> and you can see the suprascapular nerve as well. So just on this image here on the right, it's a bit more clear. So you can see the brachial plexus coming down and the suprascapular nerve. So this, I've dissected the fascia away that was sitting on the brachial plexus. And that latex dye was then sitting above that fascia as well. So I went to find the phrenic nerve, because that's what we've been talking about a lot this morning about the side effects. So this was again under another layer of fascia, so you can see there's no dye here, apart from you can see a few of the veins with the dye which have just kind of pushed out the way for the photo. So you can see the phrenic nerve running down towards the internal jugular uh, vein, um, so it does kind of make sense that this is in the same region, and obviously the latex was sitting above this, but if it's local anaesthetic, it's likely to diffuse through. Um, and you can see the brachial plexus running off um, towards the shoulder. Uh, between splenus anterior. Um, this was slide was just to show you that there was no dye kind of north of omohyoid. So here you've got the carotid artery, um, and you can see it splits into the external and the internal carotid, and you can see the first branch of the external carotid, which is the superior thyroid artery, just coming off. And you've got the vagus nerve, that big thick chunky thing running across it, and you've also got the descendant hypoglossi, which goes up into the neck to find the hypoglossal nerve. That's just underneath the mandible is where you're looking. So just kind of to summarise what this cadaveric study showed, um, plain blocks do spread to the suprascapular nerve, and we've shown that with the dye spread. We've also shown that the direction of the needle really influences the spread, which is something that we weren't really anticipating. Um, but now we've got two cadaveric heads showing different things, so we can really say that does make a difference. We can explain some of the side effects, because the phrenic nerve is really, really close, and it is just underneath that fascia where all this latex spread. I couldn't find the long thoracic nerve. Um, that could have just been me. Um, 
but it seems like it comes off much deeper and m more below the first rib um, r rather than the region we were working in. For future work, we're kind of hoping to do another cadaveric head. Um, we think the dye needs to be a lot thinner. The latex mixture we used was very, very viscous, which is obviously not the same consistency as local anaesthetic. And also these cadaveric heads, some of them have been out for a little while, so they're much drier, so they're not going to be the same um, as real life human. We also think we should do a larger volume of dye latex mixture. Um, we only use five mils to inject into the neck. We use more on the other side, but the dye just seems to go everywhere. So we only use five mils on the side that I actually dissected properly. Whereas in some of the studies that have been done, it's been 10 to 15 mils. So it made more sense to up that. Thank you very much. So, so the, the question would be, uh, so the question would be that did the dye spread up proximally to go towards the nerve or the brachial plexus? Do you, did it go uh, approximately up to hit the uh, phrenic nerve or brachial it, plexus? It's sitting above all the fascia, so it, yes, technically, it was underneath. Okay, so... It's kind of across, so basically what... There's a, there's a pre-thoracic fascia that lies over all these structures. So basically, if you inject it, it just sort of spreads along that, along that plane. And if you, I think if you put enough in and you handle it anteriorly, then some of it some of it could get the nerve, so yeah. Um. yeah, so basically going back to this study, so what they did was they injected uh, 10 mils of 1% ropivacaine in the subomoid region and compared that with 20 mils of 0.5 ropivacaine in the interscalene. So obviously by the demonstration that there's no uh, loss of crypt strength, they're saying that there's no proximal spread into the brachial plexus of the upper trunk. I think that is positive. So yeah. however, uh, Thinking anatomically, it doesn't make sense that by blocking one nerve, you're getting all the nerves as well. You know, that's the big question. That's what the replies are. And, uh, and again, they can't explain it. They really can't explain how it's happening, but that's what they're suggesting, and they, that's what the results are suggesting. And, because, and the reason I'm saying is because uh, when the studies were done, as I mentioned before, comparing suprascapular nerve block done posteriorly with interscreen block, or the pain relief was obviously much poorer with suprascapular nerve only. So the, the only way that you can say that you know, blocking this nerve on its own is actually giving a complete pain relief is by assuming that it is spreading proximally. Now obviously they're putting 10 mils of 1% uh, ropivacaine to, to make it same as 20 mils of 0.5 to uh, scalene. So probably some local is spreading up uh, and blocking the upper trunk, maybe not to that extent to give a give dense motor block but that's to be proven with further studies in what is that. But certainly, you really can't have one blocking one now of getting uh, a complete analysis here compared to interscalene. But so there we are. So before I go further, so since this, the study, the, the, the approach came to 2012, I've been doing a suprascapular nerve block with a low volume supraclavicular block to catch those two, three nerves which are not part, which are not being caught with this. And, uh, um, I've got some results for my, for my patients, so, uh, which includes, uh, so obviously, you know, since last few years, since we have, this, I've become very wary of putting into screening block for any patients who have anything more than a mild COPD or sort of where I'm worried clinically because, you know, it, it's, it's, you cannot pinpoint on one figure or one number that you can say this patient is at risk. It's a combination of factors. You look at the FEV1, you look at them clinically, how, how much mobile they are, how much they can tolerate. They look at their body habitus. So a combination of that, so from my clinical gut, I said, well, I wouldn't be, so on, on a sort of, I would say, on a cautious side, I'm trying to go away from interscaling block for those patients whom I'm really worried at in, you know, with, with little bit as well. So few patients which, which I have, have managed to get some data off. So what I'm doing is I'm putting sort of 10 mils of 0.5 uh, caracane uh, under the omoid and five mils uh, for a supraclavicular block somewhere in the middle just to catch the, uh, the other nerves. And at the same time, because I'm putting five mils uh, from the evidence, it's unlikely that five mils is going to go up to block the phrenic nerve. And I've, I've been using, uh, in any patients who has uh, uh, you know, very bad COPD and the phrenic nerve is, is, is a problem for them. And these are the results I've got. So I've got, uh, so obviously for induction, you'll use some fentanyl, which you all use. But apart from that, I haven't needed any more pain because in drop. And this is the duration I'm getting in terms of pain relief. Obviously, this was probably in early days. Maybe my technique was not that great or what, for whatever reason. But I'm consistently getting a good pain relief with this sort of volumes. And in fact, one patient 
was had such a bad uh, chest that she was supposed to go to HG anyway. And I couldn't have done interscreen block. And I did a suprascapular with the uh, supraclavicular block. And she was perfectly fine, good pain relief. With, with no issues. Obviously, I haven't uh, 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 seen the diaphragmatic movement to confirm that chronic trauma was not, not involved, but looking at them clinically, I didn't find, uh, was or not, uh, that to suggest that there was any chronic trauma involvement to cause the uh, diaphragm uh, paralysis. So that's, that's my sort of th thing, but, you know, uh, with this study, it, uh, you know, it, it might say that with that volume, you might get everything, but it's still, I'm sure uh, they can only prove it if we have a study which, which looks at diaphragm function as well, uh, and then maybe come up, then okay, one block is good enough for the shoulder surgery, and that probably would, would be a great thing if we can come up with something like that, because it is still a, a big question mark, what do we do for these patients with good, good pain relief? Sorry, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Well, th there was a there was a paper. I think somebody did mention about infraclavicular. Especially, you can get get the you know the the cords, which is where it is. Uh, coming to me, I'm not very comfortable with infraclavicular block. And again, uh, it, from patient to patient, it's not that easy to, to get the infraclavicular. And there's only one one paper. I think we talked about it, and there was no more studies on that. And uh, there is also a, a reported incidence of phrenic nerve and pneumothorax with infraclavicular. So it's not uh, you know. But I agree, I mean, that's one option, but uh, I think we need to do more studies, wait for more studies to come up. Uh, okay, well, I'll quickly, I think, should we cover the scanning bit in the, in the uh, scanner? I'll just quickly talk about the awake, just a just quick, quick touch on that. So the awake shoulder surgery, uh, uh, this is something which I've been doing. Uh, so why do we do it? I mean, obviously, for medical reasons, first of all, if patients have other issues, you can, uh, can avoid. Uh, and, uh, and for my, my, my main thing is, is the patient satisfaction. Uh, I've done pretty much nearly 200 patients now, and uh, not one patient has said, uh, said that they didn't like it, they would prefer that way. Uh, the recovery is quicker, they can eat and drink uh, quickly. Apart from that, the best part is we actually uh, watch the operation. So I'll just show you my setup here. So, uh, so that's the patient, uh, just to put in the position. So look at the position, how port upright it is uh, in arthroscopic surgery. Uh, and we have two screens here. One for the patient. Another thing I mentioned is, is the transparent drape which we use for all our upper limb patients. That's very important if, if you want to keep an eye on the head and neck of the patient. So if you have a transparent drape, the surgeons, the theater staff, us, we all can see what's happening with the head of the patient because under a green drape, it's always a risk that the head can move and there have been case reports of some sort of damage happening, you know, uh, uh, hypoxic brain injury. In fact, one of the hospitals in, in Birmingham, they have banned uh, uh, green drapes. They all want transparent drapes for uh, uh, upper limb or sort of uh, these sort of patients. So just to show what we do here, so one uh, different angles. Uh, so this is a one, one screen is, is for the patient and one screen for the surgeon. So the, and the surgeon can explain what's happening. Patients know what's happening and they, their understanding is better. I mean, they're, they're appreciative of what we do uh, and feedback is great. Uh, obviously, there are certain issues with awake shoulder, which people who do will be aware. There's a very high risk, up to 30% risk of a sudden bradycardia hypotension, which we had uh, when I started. Uh, and there are basic, some mechanisms which probably explain that. One is bizarre gyro I won't go into details for time-wise. Uh, and before I go further, so this is supraclavicular nerve, which I was talking about. So if you're doing awake shoulder, it's important to get these nerves to catch the, the skin bit over the, over the shoulder. And it's very easily done, and you can see. So what I do, when I've done this so lateral medial again, when I've done this block, I just come pull my needle out as I'm coming out on the way. I just inject a couple of mils in this plane, and that gets, gets these two nerves. You can actually uh, elicit paresthesia as well. If you use on a sensory mode nerve stimulator, you can actually elicit paresthesia in, in that region that confirms that these are nerves there. And just to, to show where it, it covers the area, that's the skin bit. And this was a paper in anesthesia 2011. Uh, I've got a lot of that. So it was a letter in 2011 uh, uh, which, which uh, sort of uh, looked at this bit. Right, so things which can contribute. There was a paper in, in Korean Journal, which again they found uh, uh, in patients who, uh, where you needed to give supplemental uh, like fentanyl or patients who were uh, on right-sided, they had a higher incidence of uh, uh, 
uh, bodyguard hypertension. Like this slide is important. Now, from what I realize in my practice is, patients uh, typically the the bodyguard hypertension happen in patients who were men, and I think we all know, as men we can have a brave face, but a lot of catecholamine is going inside without showing up. And these are the patients who actually had a, had a, a bradycardia. And one of the important input is the emotion. So if, if you're very anxious, you have high catecholamines running inside your body, and that can actually stimulate uh, the C fibers in the heart, which have a direct vagal uh, response, which actually block all the synthetic response which you normally will have. So normally if you sit up, you have a synthetic response by increasing heart rate, uh, increasing SVR. But in those patients, this response sort of blocks that synthetic response, and you get a sudden bradycardia hypotension. So the way which I have dealt with is, I've started using, uh, if I go back to my slide on the wake shoulders, I've started using some propofol here. And it's again not to make them sleepy. The idea is I run it a TCI at around uh, sort of 0.8 to 1 mic per mil, depending on, to, on the comfort level. And that takes that emotional element away. And since I've started using this, I haven't seen any more patients who have that uh, severe bodycardia hypertension. So that's something which works for me. And obviously, your block has to be good. Uh, and I don't have a block room, so I don't wait for the block. I give the block, and then I go in. The other thing which we need to do that is to, to give up, uh, obviously, we're doing up this side. But if you're doing the operation this side, we need to cover a bit of a posterior port with the local anesthetic by the surgeon. This is what my surgeon in infiltrates that. Uh, so block has to be good. Uh, uh, we go in. 20 minutes is what it takes for the block to cook. And that's the time the surgeon takes to position and you know drape. So by the time they're actually ready for knife to skin, they're pretty much ready for surgery. Sometimes they need a bit of a pull to start off. Sometimes they might need a bit of alpha fentanyl as breakthrough pain, but that's about it. And pretty much, you know, I haven't converted for the last three, three and a half years any patients uh, who needed, uh, you know, a converted GA. And the feedback is great. Lovely. Uh, just a touch on the uh, so stable tilt test, one of the medics to, it, to, uh, to explain uh, unexplained syncope. Uh, to see if patients who are prone for bradycardia, so that helps. So some patients who don't have any, any other reason, uh, they can find out the table tilt test. Uh, so that's, that's my sort of technique for, uh, for awake shoulders. So obviously we need to keep an eye on the, on the heart rate and uh, we should have access to atropine ephedrine, avoid hypo hypovolemia. We use uh, 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 flotons for all our patients who are awake. Uh, avoid adrenal containing LA because that can trigger the, the myocardial uh, C fibers. Uh, just to control the anxiety. And interestingly, uh, there has been study where actually beta blockers are protective. So, so if, if, if blood pressure is high, I'm actually very uh, uh, keen to use uh, labetalol, but actually works better in minimizing the risk of, of bradycardia hypertension. You know, I know it's counterintuitive. Okay, so just, just to touch on that. Uh, so this was a study done again in, in Norfolk where they looked at the feasibility of doing catheters for major shoulder surgery. You know, this is about 2006. That's time the shoulders cuff were done open, which was very sore, and they were kept as inpatients. So they actually uh, uh, put catheters for these patients and started sending them home. Uh, and and to, to stimulate it further, they ha they are doing it now pretty much uh, you know uh, for sh the ankle patients as well. And I think in Newcastle, uh, Womack and Verma, they're doing for their shoulder surgeries, sending patients home with catheters. So obviously the pain relief is much better because if you look at a patient with cuff repairs and SADs the pain relief, uh, the, the actual severe pain is up to two to three days, whereas a single shot block lasts for, say, 24 hours at the max. Uh, so the catheters help to keep the pain relief better for good two to three days, and, and the patients, uh, and it is fairly safe in, in the right patients. Okay, I'll just finish here.